recording is being recorded. Okay. Hello and welcome to the October 26th weekly Jupiter Lab call. Today we have 22 people on the call and let's get started right away. The first person on the agenda today is Alex. Hey, um, just wanted to thank Jeremy for getting the 3.5 uh, release out over the weekend after uh, the releaser did not work for me. Um, I was able to get clarification from him uh, and Steve that uh, the releaser just recently updated to version two. Um, so that requires changes on the Jupyter Lab side to support uh, the version two of the releaser. So until those changes are in, you can just use the 1.x branch of the releaser to do releases. That's how Jeremy got the release out for people who are dealing with that. So that's my update since I originally said last meeting that I would take care of that. Um, so Jeremy saved my butt after two days of thrashing against it. And that's thank it. you for telling me. And thank you, Jeremy, for helping. But thanks for doing the release. That's awesome. Um, cool. Next person up is Mike. I opened a proposal to add a fragment identification syntax to Jupyter. The idea is that we cannot currently point to a cell or an output so that the notebook will scroll upon opening or to embed anchors, allowing to scroll to specific fragments of the notebook. And there is a standardized method of describing how the anchors um work which is called fragment identification syntax this is the part of the uri which can be arbitrarily interpreted by the browser and it's it was uh, standardized for txt files for csv files uh, for pdfs so, and um, how we go with it is a little bit of a project-wide decision um, but in the meantime, I opened a proposal on adding cell ID uh, fragment so that we can target a cell based on its ID and uh, created a pull request providing a reference implementation for Jupyter Lab. I just wanted to put that on your radar uh, in case if you have ill feedback. It might seem that it seems that maybe we need to create a chip to get it formally accepted, but I we don't know how Jupyter standards work currently. Uh, are we still doing jobs? Um, so, that's so the yes, the jobs are one of the main things that the new software steering council is going to be doing is talking through. Um, so yeah, that is one. That is probably the best avenue if you're suggesting something that is project wide, but if you're doing an implementation that is um, that isn't going to cause downstream changes to other clients and is just like a feature, you don't have to do a JEP. Uh, but yeah, I don't I don't think I understand fully what the ramifications are. The, the ramifications are that if we decide to go for certain syntax right now, it will be difficult to change that later and other clients might want to adapt the same syntax so that uh, you can get, you can scroll to the notebook using the same kind of URL, whether you are using a uh, Jupyter Lab notebook, uh, static HTML exports or something else. Um, but yes, that's an additive change, which I, I think that this pull request could be reviewed and and potentially merge into 4.0 or an EUL release. Um, so yeah, please leave a comment if you have an opinion on whether this is the right thing to do. Um, and, and my other point is uh, that I'm working on creating an extension for um, benchmarking of user interface in Jupyter Lab, and that's for developers only, but um, if you happen to have like a user who stumbles upon um, a performance issue, you, can, you would be able to say them, uh, tell them uh, that you can 
install this extension and click start uh, some benchmarks will be run and they can report back to you with a JSON file which contains uh, information on impact of different styles and potentially in future on the JavaScript self-profiling uh, and you can analyze that. So that's excluding any uh, online uh, reporting that would be uh, problematic when it comes to privacy. So there, was, there wouldn't be an auto upload, it's just generating a static JSON dump that you can use. That looks awesome. Cool. Um, any questions, comments? Just on your first uh, proposal for the the fragment identification, do you do you want to move forward with Jupyter Lab uh, before waiting for JEP, or what? That's your wish they, on that. Let's let's wait one week, um, and if there are no major concerns, maybe we can merge this as a reference implementation and then move forward with the trap afterwards. I just wanted to raise that on, on this uh, call so that if there are any concerns, we can address that. I think that's a really good idea. And in case the implication was missed by other people on the call, this is something that goes into the URL, right? And URLs are public APIs, and we have thought pretty hard about what things we put in URLs in general. So if you have thoughts in that sphere, um, take a look at the issue because, or the, the, the proposal rather, the PR, because it's, um, these things do become sticky. Right now, because we have some time before four and we have some alpha and beta cycles, it's 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 a great time to experiment with it and see what it looks like. But just keep in mind that that's what that eventually means is modifying the shape of JupyterLab URLs. Okay, we're gonna do something we've never done before. I'm going to call the next person and she's gonna magically become host. Isabella, you are up. Okay. Um also, I can host another week because my meeting chaos. I'm sorry you had to start it. Um, I'm hosting. Where are we on the agenda? <laughs> Very You're graceful right. transition. Are... Very graceful. No, no, you are on Isabella. So oh, you do goodness. your thing. Okay. Great. <laughs> Hi. Um, sorry. I've been running around a bit this morning. Um, that's how it goes for me on the West Coast time zones usually. So, yes. Uh, my update is just last week, we talked just a little bit about Jupyter Lab Zoom stuff for anyone that wasn't here um, for various reasons, accessibility, maybe presentation mode. Uh, Jupyter Lab could have a little bit more intentional behavior for what happens when you get to high Zoom percentages for by who high, I mean like 200%, 400%, 500%, which is supported by several browsers, at least Chrome and Firefox. Right now, it just kind of all squishes together. We have various issues that are kind of documented in this, but uh, yeah, I was hoping to discuss this a little more. I don't know if we're already at the additional discussion section though, and I think this could easily be more than a five minute conversation. Um, I will post the link though, because you can also review it asynchronously outside this meeting if you wish. I believe Mike did, thank you for that. Um, unless you want the full discussion now. But I'll be quiet because I'm caffeinated and I'm talking fast, probably. Is it discussion time? I'm sorry, I was late. I'm lost. <laughs> We're still on the main agenda. Okay. Being from New York, you're not talking fast at all, Isabella. Don't worry. You weren't so. that. Yeah, exactly. We're still at the top. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. So I would like to recircle to that, but. Um, yeah, considering, I, I think in, in my experience with other things, this will be more than five minutes. So I'd like to make sure we get to everyone else first. So I will move it along. Thank you. Okay, Jason W. Okay, um, so I got a, um, a contact from Prashant, who's a PM in my organization 
he pointed out there's an issue which I linked in the um, in the notes here with Plotly and the latest version of Jupyter Lab. Um, it says that figure widget is not working with IPy widgets 8.0.0 RC0, which I was trying to do a little research on this, and it, it seems like Jupyter Lab should work with IPy widgets, but I wanted to poll the group because he contacted me just yesterday, yesterday, yesterday afternoon. Um, has anyone else seen issues with IPy widgets compatibility? Um, is there a newer IPy widgets we should be using? Any guidance on this? So they're using IPy widgets 8.0.0.0.2, right? Um, I imagine that might have something to do with it, but Jason Grell is on the call and he knows. I can see uh, it in his eyes. Yeah, I think the question is, does Plotly support IPy widgets 8? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. But maybe it doesn't, and that's the that would be the most obvious thing to look at for, to me. From a comment, uh, the link I just passed in the chat, uh, it seems that it's it's not supporting V8 yet. Is this then, uh There is an open PR too, open a week ago. Oh, there's already a yeah. PR about that. Oh, that's fantastic. Huh, I guess I missed that. And so did Prashant, my teammate. Okay. Um, Looks like there's still some active discussion on this. Looks um, like, yeah, look, that looks like the place to put effort to either test it or to see what's going on. Okay. Um, there is an IPy widgets eight migration guide in the IPy widgets eight uh, changelog documentation uh, that might be helpful here. I haven't looked at this issue. Okay. So what I'm hearing is this is more likely an issue with Plotly than it is with Jupyter Lab. Like when Plotly gets fixed, that that's the issue at heart. I think the Jupyter yeah. Lab compatibility is just like a side effect. And I think the workaround is downgrade to IPy widget seven for the time being. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, I am doing the not so hostile takeover now, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, William, I think you're next. I just wanted to advertise that Python 3.11 had this really cool release party live stream um, on Monday. And I don't know, just pointing it out, you might want to check out the YouTube recording of it. But basically what they did was intersperse the release manager doing key steps of the release live with people who had developed key new features in Python 3.11 talking about those new features. Um, so the, the talks themselves are extremely interesting and um, worth looking at and fairly short. Um, and I'm mainly mentioning it here because people here are interested in Python, but also it's actually really neat seeing, you know, somebody do a live stream release. So hint, hint, whoever does the next or any Jupyter project releases, um, if you ever want to do something like this, it would be appreciated. Uh, so fun story about that, William. Uh, we actually did the Jupyter Lab 1.0 release that way. Cool. And it was a comedy of errors. Like we, we were having issues with like to access to publish things. And we uh, like we were jokingly playing the final countdown song over and over again every time we tried. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but it was a good time. Yeah, the, the Python one seemed pretty smooth. Um, I think they're pretty practiced at this point. It was a really complex, it was weird because there are questions like how much changed from the last release candidate until the actual released version. So an interesting discussion during the live stream about that. And it was well over a hundred commits between the RC2 and the released version, which is really unusual. So, you know, they explained that that was mostly documentation and why that happened and, you know, so. I don't know, it's pretty cool to see this. And it also really humanizes, like, who's the release manager? What's involved? So, I don't know, just cool. Just point it out. And it's nice that the video is there. Darren, I think that's really... Your... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Isabella. I wanted to check, Darren, you had your hand raised and took it down. Did you have something to say? Oh, I was going to relay the story that Steve relayed. It was, <laughs> I set aside an hour. 
I think we were done 24 hours later. So, oh my God, is that the one where Jason we, late for a vacation? <laughs> is that yeah? Is that the one where we kept switching off? Oh, okay, I'm done. Somebody else take over, <laughs> and then I would do it, and I was in the car, and then I had to run to the car, and Wait, then Daria <laughs> took over. Uh, well, I would just like to say thanks to Steve's work. Hopefully, it would go much smoother uh, this next time. Sorry, Jason, were you saying something too? Jason uh, W, sorry. I hope not, because I just oh. blew my nose. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, I, I definitely, they're very practiced at this process. I don't remember how many release streams they've done, but I think I've seen at least two other ones. So they definitely know what they're doing, but always nice to hear good feedback and a uh, weird idea, but well, I don't know if they'll ever align. Like, I would be interested too if anyone's like, oh, this should be like a community call thing. I like the idea of the recording as documentation for how you fix some of those things too. So, I don't know. Weird idea. Anyone else have comments on that? I'll be quiet for a few seconds. Okay. Next, we have Steve. Do you still have time to present? Uh, yeah, I got like 20 minutes. Um, so first thing that's not on the agenda because it's security related, um, and this will come out by the time the recording is published, but we'll, we'll be releasing a CVE today um, to uh, basically stop using files in the current directory um, uh, as part of config, uh, Python files, because uh, you might not control the permissions of the folder you're running from, directory you're running from. Uh, so someone could put in a malicious file and, and that would uh, give you a bad time. Uh, so IPython had already done this. Uh, we just didn't really notice and coordinate, uh, but now Jupyter is following the suit. So this would be in Jupyter core. Um, so if any other apps are ex uh, like overriding the behavior of Jupyter core, um, you know, like Traylitz is not doing that, uh, Jupyter server is not doing that, but uh, it's worth checking um, if, you, if you own a uh, Jupyter application to make sure you're not doing that and inadvertently uh, re-exposing the CVE. Uh, but yeah, so that should be published today. There's already a published fix that came out a week ago today uh, in Jupyter Core. Um, and so uh, practically what that means is like, we had some binders that were just throwing a config file in, oh, I'm not kidding. Um, in, in the, uh, the working directory and, and, and just assuming that would work, but um, you have to instead patch dash dash config uh, um, to the, the command that's run and, and give it that file name. And then uh, I think I had to update one test on MB convert that was making a similar assumption um, and pass dash dash config in that test. Um, Is, and then, go ahead. Just a quick question. Does dash dash config take a directory to or just the actual file? That could you do? Uh, it's a pass to down? file. Okay, Second. got it. I, I wanted to know if you could do config equals dot, but you cannot. You have to give it the file. Uh, to answer Mike's question, uh, to answer your question, Darren, it is a file name. Uh, there might be a config dir um, command. Oh yeah, yeah. Jason's confirming that. Uh, but you no, know, it. it uh, so Mike, to answer your question, it's it's it, we don't look at the current working directory at all. Um, so that includes JSON files because. Uh, what you're what you're putting in that JSON file, it could be a an import path to a to a malicious uh, path on disk, because uh, like some of these configurables are are class paths or whatever. Um, so it's still an attack vector to load config um, from the current work directory, even if it's JSON, um, because it gets interpreted as Python. Um, any other questions on the CVE? I'll just mention there's an environment variable you can set in order to add things to the path. And so that's one way you could revert back to the old behavior if you explicitly want to. Yeah, so either command line switch or environment variable, these two options, if you know what you're doing. In quotes. <laughs> uh, all right, so next is uh, Jupyter releaser. Uh, so as Alex mentioned, we're transitioning from V1 to V2. And I think Jupyter Lab is, is the only one that's a bit lagging. Is there, it's doing a lot as part of the release process. Uh, that was like our hard case for releaser. So there's a couple of minor things that need to be updated in Jupyter Lab itself to accommodate it. Uh, but once that's done, 
uh, it's, I think, a lot better, uh, even if you don't use the release from repo um, uh, workflow that, that V2 was intended for. But we are using the release from work, uh, workflow across three different GitHub orgs now as, as test cases, using bot accounts for email, GitHub, uh, PyPI, and NPM with appropriately scoped permission and tokens. Uh, so our, our test case in the Jupyter Lab org it was Jupyter Lab Server. We made a release of that using our our uh, credentials from our our Jupyter Lab bot uh, account um, that has now admin access to that repo, but checks to see who's running the the workflow to make sure they are admin as well. Uh, the commit comes in as the that author's email address, but the release and the release assets are made using that bot's. Um, uh, credentials. So if you go on to PyPI uh, under the security tab for Jupyter Lab server, you'd see the bot account was the, the one to make the most recent release. Um, we've not yet tested NPM, but it's set up so the NPM bot has access to the the at Lumino and at Jupyter Lab uh, namespaces. Um, it just we haven't we haven't tested that out yet, but it, it should be good to go. So there's there's a set of bots for each GitHub org right now, three sets of them. Um, that have appropriately two-factor authorization set up and all that, and their you know, credentials are in a, in a shared um, for, for Jupyter admins. They're in a shared location um, for that in a vault. Um, so yeah, we're, this is still sort of experimental. So if anyone has any feedback on that, but I, yeah, I think um, we've taken a lot of feedback from folks along the way, and it's it's a pretty pretty solid system now. Uh, and then hopefully once. Super Lab gets those couple small things changed. Uh, it could also use the workflow of um, releasing from Jupyter Lab, so you don't need like that. As long as you're an admin on that repo, uh, you can make releases now, um, and you don't need to have your fork of Jupyter releases set up with this PyPI token map that you have to babysit. Uh, so the, the the that bar and uh, maintenance um, is a lot lower, and you can share the load of of making releases a lot easier going forward. And we'll accommodate uh, Williams 4.0 release party. <laughs> Does that live stream itself? Yeah, yeah, it's part yeah. of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would love to use this for IPy widgets and, you know, obviously there's other Jupyter repos. It's been a bit of a moving target for the release bots, which has been wonderful because there's so many things that you've been adding and updating and, and improving and polishing. Um, do you have an idea of when? you think you would call it as a, I don't know, 1.0 release, like you would say, okay, this is ready for other Jupyter projects to use? Yeah, so it, it, it's it's publishing, the actions are under a V2 tag, um, and we're the, the, the Python package is still called alpha to, to signify this is, we're not finished with the V2 yet. Um, I think once, uh, once Jupyter Lab is using it successfully, I, I've used it across all the other repos that I release on. Uh, so it's it's done except for Jupyter Lab, I would say, and then and then I would say we can lock it down and stop making breaking changes for version two um, and move forward. Out of curiosity, um, have we updated the cookie cutter? Because the cookie cutter uh, instructs the user once they open the cookie cutter to use the releaser to release cookie cutted uh, extensions. So uh, no, that. That's a good point. Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, I'll make a note to uh, look at the cookie cutters. Yeah, because that was how I first discovered that the releaser was being updated very quickly. Was when I went to release my cookie cutter based extension. Yeah, that, they're probably still using the V1 tag, but you as the releaser on your fork, were, were using uh, the V2 stuff basically. So it was, it was kind of in a mixed state. Uh, that, that was hard to, that's another, another way it makes more sense to do it from the repos. Uh, so you're kind of, you it's, it's more stable when everything is, is, is targeting a stable version tag, as opposed to having a fork that you're updating to the latest commit to make these changes. Uh, and then the last bit is, um. So we've been trying to accommodate changes in Jupyter or uh, Python core around async IO uh, in that they, they're, they don't wanna be as fast and loose with event loops as they had been. Um, that's one part of it. Other part is we were using nest async IO 
which is completely against what Python wanted uh, in terms of having re-entrant event loops. Uh, they don't support it explicitly. Actually, Guido had mentioned as part of this, this thread uh, recently that they might still consider it going forward. It's just they, uh, they thought it was impossible, but he has an idea it might be possible. So that, that we still might get re-entrant um, event loops in Python eventually, but they don't exist. So the, the, the break and change for us was that get event loop, uh, the top level async IO dot get event loop used to just create one uh, and you're ready to go if there wasn't one there. Uh, and Tornado was relying on that, ZMQ was relying on and, and therefore we were in a lot of ways. Um, but now um, uh, that raises deprecation warning because they intended to uh, make that an alias for get running loop. So it would fail if there was a, not an actually installed and running loop event loop. Uh, so we had to make some changes um, at uh, starting uh, uh, min made some changes in CMQ. Uh, we've got some changes coming in Jupyter client uh, 8.0 to accommodate that. Working on changes in Jupyter server, trying to work that up the stack to to where we're uh, in in uh, alignment with what uh, Core Python is doing, and also trying to get ourselves off of Nest Three Sync IO uh, because we've seen bugs related to that in the wild. Where like if you start an event loop. And then try to nesting to go apply it after the fact. You can get into um, there's like a long running thread on Jupyter Lab where people have hit bugs from that. Um, so getting rid of nesting sync IO is just a good thing to do in general. And this gave us a good opportunity to rethink the way we're handling event loops. Um, the one concession that they might make, there's an open PR against CPython 3.12 right now, is that they might make get event loop uh, return a an installed but not running loop. Um, so it would not be an alias for get running loop, but it would it would also not install one for you. So it would fail if there's not one there. Uh, but if you had installed the loop using a set event loop, ran it to completion, and it was still sitting there, uh, get event loop would return that one. So you have a running loop that's in a state of uh, not running and not closed uh, that you could run again on. Um, that would clean up some of the logic we currently have in client to like work around that fact where we're like bookkeeping the the loops that we've created we could get rid of that logic but that would be a, a nice to have um and we don't necessarily need that uh from them so that's that thanks for all those updates i always appreciate that because i don't know how i keep up with uh half the things you do to be honest without them so thank you so much steve uh anyone else have things to say Silence. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's probably a should be a thanks from all of us. So yeah. Um, Fred, are you ready to present? Yeah. Uh, so uh, at Quantstack, we have been working hard of bringing uh, a better RTC to three the three branches, so first to four and then backporting as much as possible to three. Uh, and uh, I would like everybody to try because we have a binder to be able to use it. So I will, it's uh, the link that's in the in the notes, but I just passed the link into the, the to the chat too. So just open it and write things and edit things or add new things and just like, break things <laughs> just to see <laughs> it's probably gonna break <laughs> like it's the first first time we are trying it with so many people uh, so the the idea is uh, it's gonna break api on the rtc front uh, compared to 3.5 uh, but those api are uh, tagged as uh, uh, like alpha features so it's fine and uh, the the idea is also to still keep the the flag, so uh, that will the the RTC uh, stuff will be used only if the flag for collaboration will be uh, set up. Uh, there are some discussion that are going on because uh, uh, we will need to to be able to plug also the con optionally to plug the the new file ID system uh, that has been uh, pushed by people. Uh, colleague of JSON wide uh, on the uh, Jupyter server. Uh, so yeah, there, there are still uh, some work to be done uh, before reaching like a, a beta, but we're we are getting there slowly. Thanks a lot for everybody for connecting. 
Thanks for your work on this, Frederick. Oh, I'm not the only one. There is lots of people like Carlos, David, that are also connected. Uh, they've done tremendous work on that. So yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think yeah, the other point for me is like uh, there is the performance meeting just after this one, so that's in 20 minutes for people that are interested. And yeah, I think that's it. And maybe we can try to do the the note in the. A collaboration, a collaborative Jupiter Lab, then next week. Oh, that would be good. Do, should we leave a note for that somewhere? Does that seem uh, good, or will someone just remember? <laughs> I, I think uh, I can maybe just edit the the AKMD to say, okay, this time, yeah. this week it's gonna be that link, <laughs> and I will spin up a, a, a collaboration, a collaborative Jupiter Lab just before the meeting. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is really good. I'm assuming because you said just break it in general, there's nothing really specific you want tested, just the RTC stuff needs extra. Care. Yeah, right Right now is at least to see like if we are not losing data. I just refreshed the page, for example, to see and apparently everything is still there. So that's the kind of thing that are interesting. And uh, I've seen that. I mean, that this meeting is probably the most substantial stress test we've done for RTC. So if, if RTC can work with this meeting. I am very confident that it can work for many other users. We say before it gets like used in a hundred or two hundred lecture hall. Yeah, but <laughs> it's a good no. It's the best that we can feasibly do. I just yeah, yeah. yeah I'm just being cynical. The, 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 then we we'll, we we'll yeah. let empty file isn't saving, which is kind of breaking, right? If you that's losing data, right? You're inputting data and it's you can't save it, but at least you have a chance to manually back it up if you. Uh, you try to create a new a new one, Vidar? No, it was the MD file that was open already when they connected. So I made some edits, and I'm not sure if you guys see the edits, but at least it's uh, in a dirty state, and the, the hover says that it was last saved six minutes ago. Oh, then you, yeah, you, you, you eat something. OK. <laughs> Yeah, because nobody tried to rename. Like there, there, there's gonna be so that's why I was speaking about the Fire ID service that we want to be able to plug in. Uh, also, it's uh, it's because there is a a huge constraint in case of uh, somebody uh, rename the file, uh, especially if it's done externally of the Jupyter Lab uh, environment. But so it seems it's not related to that this time. So, okay. <laughs> That, that I guess won't combine very well with the new thing where the first time you hit save, it will ask you if, whether you want to rename it. I assume that won't trigger for RTC stuff since it's not saving with the same mechanism. Yeah, you're right. It's not saving with using the same mechanism because everything is done automatically in the back end by time to time is uh, is saving uh, on the on the arg uh, on the file. On, system. Okay. Uh, William and Vidar and maybe Mike, can I copy your comments into the notes so we have them for later? Seeing yes from William. Oh yes, okay. sorry, I put them in the wrong place. No, no, chat is good. I just, I think these are probably good things to have written somewhere. Is, is is that all on this? Are people going to keep messing with it? And I should let you all be quiet longer. I think we still have other people, so I'm fine. We do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we do. But, but I was for trying. Everybody trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, thank you for bringing binder links like that. I know for me, it makes it much easier to try than than having to get it all set up on my own. So thank you so much for me. Um, cool. Where are we? Where are we? And performance meeting. Go to that. The performance people are very nice. Um, Corey, you are next on the agenda. Am I seeing people? There we go. Hello, everybody. Um, hey, um, so I'm from GitHub. I've been working with Vidar. Uh, we're working on setting up MB Dime as a rich diff view on github.com. Um, Vidar has been lovely to work with and very helpful. Um, and we're going to start preparing to do like a beta test with a, a larger group of people. Uh, but we were interested to see if anybody here uh, wanted to try it out and provide any feedback, um, kick the tires, uh, see what we got wrong, <laughs> um, because there's probably things. Um, and we've been uh, working on upstreaming some stuff to 
um, the NVDIN repo. So, you know, hopefully anything that we find, we can, we can upstream as well and try to make that project better. Um, but I kind of threw together a really, I'm a programmer, not like a marketing person or something. So I put together like a really ugly, terrible Google doc. Uh, <laughs> you can just like drop a uh, GitHub username and then an email into. Um, and then uh, if you do that, here, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Um, let me see. Let me see which of these makes sense to share. Um, so if you do that, and I, uh, I can add you to a future flag and I'll email you like once you're in it, and then it will uh, show a new feature preview, um, which is Rich Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and then do, 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 uh, Um, then we'll do like this loading thing like we do with normal notebooks. Uh, and there's like a in GitHub to their lab diff with MBDime. Um, but yeah, so we're just looking for people to kick the tires and um, see what they think. Yeah, this is really cool. Thank you for bringing it to us. I'm seconding Jason Gratz's comment there. Yay. Well, it's been a long time coming. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't doubt that. Um, yeah. <laughs> the pretty big thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, someday if I ever meet any of you, we can talk politics. Uh <laughs> off over. the recorded call. Yeah, yeah. Um, are you Oh, go on, I just yeah. wanted to add that I'm super excited to finally see this, you know, on GitHub and, and actually running and, and not just being talk, talked about. So thanks for actually, you know, pushing it through it and getting it, getting it done. So hopefully, um, Did I'm I sure miss... there will be bugs that come out of it. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to spend some more cycles on the end of that. that that's awesome. If they come in. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And me and Vidara have been, you know, speaking, um, there's some there's some things we'd love to do to it, um, but again, it all comes down to internal politics. So we'll just see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Corey, um, oh, sorry. Go on. I was just going to ask uh, about performance because I realize you're running at a scale that you know boggles everyone's minds. Uh, were there any performance issues at, at the scales you were looking at? So uh, this is interesting. Uh, I actually, uh, just this year, I rebuilt the GitHub notebook server um, because it failed about 60% of the time um, was our internal stats. Um, and to make NB convert actually work at scale, um, we had to change some things about like how validation works. Uh, and we're looking at some of the things around syntax highlighting um, because syntax highlighting in NB convert is really slow. Um, uh, so, that was some of the performance things that we looked at over there. So we, we actually pushed up a change to NB convert um, to do what we call like optimistic validation um, because NB convert validates after every single filter runs, uh, which can add up to 70% of the total load time to that tool. Um, so we just ran it at the end because um, like why validate after every filter? We don't need that. Um, um, and that really helped. And then another thing we have to deal a lot with is people who push up invalid notebooks. Um, like you could have an invalid head or an invalid base. Um, and, and there's lots of different states of invalid that we get. Um, so we've had to do a lot of work around uh, telling users like your notebook is invalid, which notebook is invalid and what's invalid about it, um, which we've been leading on MB format um, for, for that tooling. Um, and then performance stuff on MBDime, um, the brute force algorithm isn't the fastest, but, um, you know, there's other things in the system that are, that are slower on uh, just in getting things off of Git and stuff like that. Um, so it's not a huge deal. Um, one thing that we did push up, uh, PR for last week that, that I built was that the current version of MBDime will render every single cell in the notebook, even if it didn't change. Um, so we, we changed it to do a lazy um, display. 
um, and that made the front end faster. Um, yes, yeah, cell ID support would be great, um, like Vidar is saying. Um, another thing that would be, I think, nice uh, in in like looking at how the diff algorithm works is if if the cells actually had a timestamp of when they were changed, um, then you could just diff the ones that had changed since the last version, um, which would make that easier. Um, also, you know, cell IDs would be helpful for like commenting. Uh, we're not going to actually roll out with commenting. Um, we just weren't given the allotted time to build it. Um, but it would be easier to, to do that if, if there were cell IDs or, or some sort of an ID um, to allow commenting at the cell level. Um, otherwise, we're going to have to do some sort of JSON source mapping solution. Uh, Fred, go ahead. You have your hand raised. Yeah, it's just uh, not to put pressure or just an interested question. Uh, is there any plan to uh, move to Code Mirror 6 instead of Code Mirror 5? Or maybe you are already using another so, editor? Uh, uh, my plan is to have Jupyter Lab uh, solve all the problems first. And then uh, when it's ready and mature, hopefully to put that into it directly. Yeah. Yeah, because it will also help definitely on the performance side. side to yeah. Resource. So. Um, uh, uh, the, the main thing, the question that we'll have at that point is to figure out uh, uh, the syntax highlighting, right? To, to have support for all the correct map types in all languages. Thanks. Otherwise, thanks a lot. This look very cool. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Vidar, not me. I just set it up. <laughs> you did all the hard work. Yeah, well, you for sure did a lot of stuff to make it look better and, and be more performant, so. It takes a village. That is true. Any other questions? We will be quiet for a few seconds in typical Isabella form. OK. Yeah, this is super exciting. And uh, also, just I hope you're patting yourself on the back for getting to share it with us all. In my experience, that's really hard work uh, to get this out here um, publicly. So thank you and congrats. Darian? Um, I think this is awesome. And I think it'll help a lot of people. I was curious, do you have, when you deploy features like this, do you have accessibility requirements for shipping a feature? And will this meet your accessibility requirements? And if it doesn't, can you help us help it meet your accessibility requirements so it can meet our accessibility requirements too? Yeah, so that's a real problem. <laughs> um, it does not come anywhere close to meeting our accessibility requirements. Uh, we took it to our accessibility team and, and they were just like, this is terrible. Um, the only thing that you had going for you is I was able to take them to the accessibility page and say, look, the entire ecosystem is inaccessible. And they said, well, if the entire ecosystem is inaccessible, we can't ask you to make this one thing inaccessible because no one could use it anyways. Um, so our solution to the accessibility problem was that we needed to have leave the link to the JSON version of the file so that the user has a way to see a version that is more accessible than the Jupyter version. Because so our JSON Code Mirror 6 will help you a little bit, right? Code Mirror 6 will at least make the cells not, not black boxes, but that's only a little bit. But yeah, I mean, if this is something that you plan on doing more work on, then you know, please loop us in on it because we want to make we want to make the exact same components work better for everyone. Yeah, no, that would be nice. Um, I don't think that, I don't I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea what's on the horizon for my team. Um, <laughs> uh, so I don't know. Um, I, do, I, I do know that that was like the one loophole we were able to get this in under is to like leave the JSON version so that someone 
who has an accessibility uh, 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 need can, can use the version of the JSON because our JSON is more accessible than actually using Jupyter Notebooks. Yeah, thank you for asking, Darian. Um, and thanks for the honest feedback. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what I expected, but I, <laughs> I'm still sorry to hear it. Um, yeah. I also see one more question in the chat from Jason Grout. Do you have idea of launch timeline? Uh, reminder, this is recorded. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't have any idea as of, as of yet. So yeah. Good, safe answer. Um Cool. Since we're close to time, this is really awesome. And I'm sure this could sustain discussion, but I want to try and get to the rest of the agenda. So please follow up. I know Corey provided opportunity. Thank you so much for showing this. Um, Chris, are you ready to talk? Yes, I am. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Chris, a product manager also from GitHub. Um, wanted to let everyone know that, you know, based on a bunch of user feedback we've been hearing, <laughs> we rolled out or we are planning to roll out uh, Jupyter Lab support in code spaces. Uh, so I know we're short on time. I'll just show a super, super quick demo. Keep it as brief as possible. Can you see my screen? I'm seeing a hack the HackMD. Perfect. Okay. That's great. Um, so can you see the repository now? Stable Diffusion, yeah. Excellent. So this is just a, a Stable Diffusion repository that I've set up. I have a code space in here that's already running. So now I can just click on that and it'll bring me into Jupyter Lab in the code space running in the cloud. Uh, and I'll be able to you know, modify uh, and do all of the Git operations. So in this case, yeah, I can just select the last couple of cells here, run those selected cells. Uh, and none of this is happening on my machine. It's all happening in the cloud, but it's also accessed directly through the GitHub repository. Um, so we're very excited about this. Uh, and are planning to roll it out uh, at least in beta uh, shortly uh, and wanted to give everyone a heads up um, that that was on the way. In terms of the initial beta functionality, I showed you pretty much most of it. Uh, you can access Jupyter Lab via uh, the web application or via the CLI. Uh, we do also, we're planning to enable GPUs in code spaces. Um, we're still working on making sure that we have the appropriate inventory to do that uh, as general availability. But right now, if you have specific needs, you can reach out to me and, and request GPU access, and we can give that to you. Uh, and then finally, the, the last piece of this that we're not going to be rolling out within beta, but we'll be adding hopefully soon after that, is remote kernel execution. Uh, so being able to do that directly from the GitHub website uh, and from Jupyter Notebooks in there. Uh, as opposed to actually running the, the full-fledged IDE within a code space. Kind of another mic drop of a share, huh? Yeah, we are super excited about this. And please, 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 we really want feedback. I really want feedback. Um, and I would love to make sure that we're representing it properly when we start getting to you know the blog posts, social, things like that. So please reach out to me. I would love to coordinate on that messaging. Uh, and also would love to give any of you who are interested in access to start playing around with it. Yeah, this is also fantastic. Any comments? I know we are close to time, but it's also kind of a big deal. So <laughs> I won't, I won't stop y'all. Yeah, I know I'm really interested in this one. So you'll probably be hearing from me. Awesome. Yeah. And also just so that you're you're both getting it, thank you also for sharing this, like Jason said, but also thank you for whatever I'm sure quite uh invisible work that it took to get it to share with us. So that's a lot. Thank you. Um just to get it explicit, Chris. Is this something we would have to uh, opt it, ask for access to, or is this available for everyone? Yeah, great or question. Repos? So right now, you have to ask for access to it. When we roll it out in the beta, which we're planning to do in the coming weeks, I know it's recorded, so I won't give a definitive date. Uh, been burned on that before. Uh, uh, in, the, in the coming weeks to, to month, we'll be planning to roll out the initial beta of this, at which point it will be publicly available to everybody. Um, when we do roll that initial beta out, though, you will still need to request specifically request access to GPUs. 
Awesome. Good question. Um, if I can, I'm going to transition us in our last minute to Jason Grout. You have some stuff here too. Yeah, let me share my screen here and I'll try to give you a very short and sweet uh, thing. Can you see my screen? I am seeing Jupiter Lab. Perfect. Excellent. Um, so uh, the idea here is something that Pete brought up uh, a few weeks ago from a demo he did a few years ago. We pursued this last week in the widgets workshop that was in London. And the idea is we want to make it possible for people to provide uh, rich outputs without installing extensions and just having sort of the feeling from Notebook 6 of being able to just work on the browser and push stuff to the browser straight from the kernel. So here's the basic idea. Uh, we're doing a stock display call with a MIME bundle. This MIME bundle has two MIME types. One MIME type is our new MIME type that we're introducing. And this new MIME type is an ES6 module. And the CS6 module has exports one function called render. And the render function takes an output message, i.e. this message that you're looking at right here, uh, a DOM element, and a context argument that contains a bunch of APIs that's to be determined. And, uh, and this MIME bundle also has one other MIME type, just some data. And so what happens is when I execute this, uh, it goes to the front end. It takes this ES6 module. And it runs and, and it and it runs the ESX module, imports the ES6 module, and calls the render function with this message, including this data down here, and lets this ES6 module actually format the message format the message as a rich display on the front end. And so what you end up here is just creating an HTML table. Um, in case you're wondering, the encode here, all it's doing is taking this string that represents an ES6 module and encoding it as a data URL. So the idea here is we'd like to write a renderer for this MIME type right here that provides an API that you know if you export a render function, we will call it with this message uh, with these particular uh, you know elements from the front end that's uh, doing this render. And again, the idea here is uh, any package would be able to include with itself the JavaScript to render uh, rich items out of that package. And uh, it could work across many front ends. Right now, you know, uh, a rich renderer, it's an extension to Jupyterlab, doesn't work in Colab or Databricks or Notable or a bunch of other, uh, you know, front ends. Or, or, uh, and this allows uh, a minimal API that's based on the browser APIs uh, in order to do rich outputs in many different front ends. And, uh, and it avoids the problem of trying to keep an extension up to date with what's in the kernel, which is an issue that we've always had in IPy widgets uh, by just having everything sort of in the kernel. Um, and it allows you just really easily, quickly explore without having to write an extension, uh, ways of rendering your MIME, type, uh, your MIME data uh, in a rich way. So the and actually the code for this minimal demo is super, short. It's using the modern browser APIs. Essentially, this is all the magic right here. We just import that string as a data URL and then call the render function with the things that we've said we would call it with. Um, so our big question is, uh, Pete and I would like to work on this. Uh, any objections to moving this repo? I linked it in the notes. Uh, into the JupyterLab org to push this uh, forward with an eye that if and when it matures, maybe eventually it could be included in core. Two sum up reactions. I feel like party hat is a yes. <laughs> right, yeah, I'm now seeing that one too, yeah. <laughs> um, I do not have any objections, but I have a... a addendum or extra information that that context the api there is uh, uh the goal of to be that is to be super stable across major versions and uh, to be uh kind of once a symbol has been defined and added to that you can never change the signature kind of api because it would need to be supported across all front ends and they, all of them will be optionally present so, so if it's not there you should be able to fall back uh, that's where uh, uh, most of the 
interesting discussion will happen, I assume. But um, the, the kind of minimal version Jason presented here, I, I think should be pretty uh, uncontroversial in terms of the API design. Yeah, we imagine that context dictionary might have facilities for creating comms to a kernel uh, to be able to interact with a kernel. Uh, maybe uh, a function that would tap into whatever the run the the current front end rendering system is, so you could render inside of yourself a mime bundle. Um, and there's a few other ideas we have for some some initial minimal uh, uh, things that are would be provided in that context optionally. Okay, so I see a a raised hand and a couple of uh, thumbs up for moving the repo into Jupyter Lab, Mike. Cas whether that rendering should happen in iframe with isolation. Excellent question. I think that's a question for how the front end renders this particular mime type. Um, you know, clearly it's it's better if it's in an iframe security wise. At the same time, we already render JavaScript without an iframe. So my guess is any of the enterprise front ends like Colab or Databricks, et cetera, will make sure that they're rendering it inside of an iframe. Uh, but really, that's up to the front end. And right now, we we adopted the same model as JupyterLab has, which is, hey, we just run JavaScript in the current context. That's cool. Um, as long as it's trusted, right? Or just the next execution. As long as it's trusted. Yeah, exactly. OK, I'll move the repo into JupyterLab. That's a sort of a low friction thing to move forward. Pete and I are planning on working on this. Uh, and uh, as it as it matures, We'll take the, the question of whether we should pull it into core. Thanks. Thank you for asking. I am now going to stop. I know we have to watch for the call, but thank you all for being here. I'm going to stop the recording so we can have any off recording questions. Feel free, though, if you need to go to go. And